So this is the last of the kind of intro astronomy unit. Uh, you'll have, I'll apologize up front for kind of going through this stuff quickly, um, but I'm kind of nervous about how long we're going to be in school and how much stuff we have to cover. Um, so I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly because um, we've already covered a bunch of this. I, I like to go through it because it has some images um, that kind of fit in with what we've done. Uh, so this is going to go through the Copernican revolution. Um, so once again, here's a different picture of Stonehenge. I like to show this for two different reasons. Um, one is you get the sense of how big these rocks are. Um, see, there's like an average size guy there and see how big these, these things are like 18, 20 feet tall. Um, they weigh a ton. Um, and this actually shows you how the sun comes up over one of those rocks on the summer solstice right there. So that's a, a neat picture. Uh, Interesting point, these rocks are not from right here. They're from like 20 miles away. The geologists actually found the formation. Um, so you can see how important they thought this was um, because they dragged them there and then stacked them on top of each other, which is incredible. Um, here's what I like to sometimes refer to as ghetto Stonehenge. Um, the Native Americans did this and basically it serves a lot of the same purposes, only they didn't have to get the help of the aliens or whoever to uh, stack the rocks on top of each other. They just made piles in a circle. Um, and this basically works like a, a, you know, a calendar, if you will. Um, so you can kind of think to yourself, like, why would they do these things? And why would they need a calendar? But it may have been for farming. It may have been for following, um, you know, out there elk or, or uh, bison or something like that. So this is in um, Wyoming. The big, big horn medicine wheel. Uh, this is a temple at Caracol, Mexico. Um, they had many windows that pointed to astronomical events as well. Um, ancient astronomers observed the sun, moon, stars, and then the five closest planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are the ones that they could see without telescopes. And we sometimes refer to the inferior planets as Mercury and Venus because uh, they're closer to the sun. And then the superior planets are the ones that are farther away. Uh, let's skip through there. So this is, if you remember Ptolemy's idea, um, this is kind of another version of, of that. Um, sh showing how they give the, the retrograde as we pass Ma Mars in our orbit, since our orbit takes less time. So some of the foundations of the Copernican revolution. The Earth is not at the center of everything. The center of the Earth is the center of the moon's orbit. All planets revolve around the sun. The stars are very much farther away than the sun. The apparent movement of the stars around the Earth is due to the Earth's rotation. The apparent movement of the sun around the earth is due to the earth's rotation and retrograde motion of planets is due to earth's motion around the sun. So here are Galileo's actual drawings um, when he followed the Galilean moons. Um, these are the, the four largest moons of Jupiter. Um, and this is actually taken right from his journal. So you can see how he followed them over time. This is really important because um, this was the first time that anybody could ever say with any definitiveness that any certainty that something was going around something other than the earth everything else looks like it's going around us but these moons were definitely going around jupiter and he watched that happen night after night um there's the same picture of venus going around so that was also used as a proof of the heliocentric model uh kepler and brahe uh, once again the the ellipse Kepler's laws. So, and one this is this is uh, important. One astronomical unit is the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that basically, the average distance from the Earth to the Sun is what we call one astronomical unit, and that's how we tend to measure things in the solar system. Now we use radar to to measure this, um, and we you know, measure the amount of time it takes for them to, the radar waves to bounce back. Newton's laws of motion explain how objects interact with the world and with each other. Uh, so first law, object at rest will remain at rest. Object moving in a straight line 
a constant speed will not change its motion. So that's basically inertia. Second law is this equation or some version of it. Uh, A equals F over M or F equals MA, however you want to say it. And Newton's third law is action reaction. Uh, he also came up with the law of gravity. Um, the, on Earth's surface, acceleration of gravity is approximately constant, 9.8 meters per second squared uh, towards the center of the Earth. Um, Newton's laws of gravity um, is this. This is how gravity in between two objects uh, occurs. So if you have two objects here, you the, the force of the gravity, I should just say the gravitational force is equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the first one times the mass of the second one divided by the radius squared. So this radius is going to be the number that is going to determine how much force there is. It's going to have the greatest, greatest factor. Um, quick aside, in the state science testing, there's always a question like this. And all you have to do to figure out how which one has the greatest or least gravitational force is by looking at the radius. So the one with the largest radius will have the least force. The one with the smallest radius will have the most force. Uh, let's see. Nothing. And that, that's about it. So that one was, was relatively quick. Um, so have a great day.